So, this is all I'm going to give you about this book as far as premise. It's about a girl, a young black girl in Baltimore. In the near future, as I write about the near future, um, who is trying to figure out what's going on with her life. She likes tats, and someone offers her something better than a tat. Somebody offers her a chance to get wins. And being young and you know, young people, we you know make rash decisions. You know, in our youth, she makes this rash decision to get these wins without really figuring out what that means to have a big ass pair of wings on your back. <laughs> she views a playground, bleeding colors mashed up as if framed on a wall in a gallery, yet kinetic and tangible in the sight and sounds of her subconscious. Rendered from her point of view, she is in it, climbing up the smooth burnished metal cool in the shade of the big tree which lords over the playscape. She can recall being careful to avoid the streaks of bird droppings that intermittently stain the handrails as she climbs higher and higher. The clouds seem to grow as the summit of the slide grows closer. And Ariel again processes anticipation buried in the dream of a recollection, a hope for a memory within a memory. The voice fading as she worked over the years to repress the pain of the experience the formative moment of a specific type of fear. Despite the lack of clarity, she hears her. Depending on the day, the words are not often distinct, and sometimes the voice sounds like other folks, Mrs. Bell or Aunt Rita in particular, but Aerie knows that voice. It's her. Aerie, be careful, the voice intones, as she struggles to pull her feet from under her to sit down on the slide backside planted on the slide with feet shooting out front, ready to rocket down the iron path to waiting arms. The squeaky friction of the metal battles gravity as airy hurdles downward. She is then enveloped by her mother, and at this moment in the dream, no matter how many times she experiences this journey, the first little paper cut that marks her feelings, a sense of longing and loss that carries forth from memory to dream to now. It is a pain that Aerie holds to herself, not to be shared with counselors or psychologists or Rita, not that Rita would even be sympathetic. Aerie then feels a sense of weightlessness as her mother lifts her onto the swing, feet dangling above the small trench where other children and adults have dug their feet into the sand to propel themselves skyward. She feels her mother guide her hands to hold onto the chains that hold the swing, and she feels a hand on her back. Airy glides forward, and the sensation of the wind rushing up her legs and through her hair returns. The elation of traveling on the upward path of the swing's ellipse creeps again from her dream into her present state of being. With squinting eyes and a wide smile, a light trail of tears streaks the sides of her face as she moves faster and higher, peals of laughter escaping even as she curls her toes. Airy hears her mother giggle behind her and say, Look how high you are, Airy. The memory of laughter as Airy kicks her legs, the swing twisting a bit. Mommy, I want to come down. A push in her back. Keep going, Airy, keep going. Airy notices notices how the clouds rush towards her, then away as, she, as the swing moves back and forth, and another paper cut is felt as the fear creeps in with each successive push as the clouds grow in size. Mommy, I am getting off. Now she is letting go, and the last thing she hears is, look, Ari, you're flying. Ari doesn't remember landing on her hands and knees or hitting her head. It was a small stone sticking out of the sand, she would later learn, that drew the blood that streamed from her forehead. She can't recall her mother screaming for help. The dream evokes the subsequent conversations with Rita. It is when she is older that she understands that the very day in this dream was the last day she spent with her mother, that it was Rita and not her mother who made sure she received proper care. Those facts remain with Ari and constitute an entirely different realm in her mind. But the outcome of the dream, 
The last snippet of her mind's telling of that specific moment is cemented with the sensation that flying equals falling, and to fall is painful. This fear shaped Aries' life, whether it be refusing to travel on a plane for an eighth grade class trip to London, or inciting Rita's wrath at Five Flags Amusement Park by refusing to ride anything that required her to be more than two feet off of the ground. Rita could be heard muttering with an earshot, I should have took this bitch over. Ari embraced her phobia and made it part of her public persona by doing things like only sitting on the lower bleachers during school sports games, or saying things like, Ooh, you know I don't do, I don't do heights. I'm not climbing up that ladder to hang out artwork, Miss Sinquez. Behind the persona, she felt that she lost more than her mother that day. So she mourned like most children do, through moments of random insolence and discreet self-immolation. Aries' latest act of rebellion situated her at the crossroads of her greatest fear and the possibility of reshaping the reality of everyone in her life. The girl with the fear of heights dreamed while a procedure was underway to surgically implant a large pair of wings in her back. Ari and her closest friend Dean were in the living room, surrounded by children, beads, barrettes, combs, brushes, and all manners of grease. Between Ari's legs sits her friends Latrice's youngest, Yancelia, hair akimbo, the other half braided with intricate patterns of recursive precision. Girl, where the hell you learn to do that style? You always do some crazy patterns, Dean asked, marveling at Ari's handiwork. Ari laughed. You would never guess in a million years where I got this from. She leaned over and pulled out a tattered National Geographic magazine from inside a binder. Rita had a stack of these in the living room. Remember how Big Ma taught us how to do plaques? Well, one day I was waiting for Rita to get home and Wi-Fi was off. So I was sitting here looking through all these magazines she had here. You know my butt was bored sitting here trying to read something that wasn't for school. Ari stopped her work on the young girl's hair and picked up the magazine and continued. These magazines were more about the pictures telling the story than someone writing about something. And I found this one and it had a story about a wedding in Africa. It had all these nice pictures of the bride and her sisters, hair done up all crazy kinds of ways. I tore the pages out of that book and started practicing on people. Remember when I braided your tracks when you went to the prom with Neff? Oh yeah, I remember that. You told me an African taught you that pattern. Dean twisted up her lips. Did I lie though? I learned from these pictures of Africans. You start to plait the same way you do in the regular cornrows. But I had to buy one of those black hair magazines to see the techniques to create some of these angles and twists. The magazines have good lessons on how to do stuff, but they never really have lessons on how to do these African patterns. I had to figure it out. All this time, I'm thinking you're going over to Park Avenue or Utah talking to one of those Africans over there. Shoot, them tricks not trying to come up off of what they know. They making $200 every time someone sits in their chair. You should open up a shop. I'll be your nail technician. Open up a shop with what? Have Rita tell it. She don't have no dough. Nobody else around here got it either. I can make just about as much going to people's houses and doing it. But you doing Celie's hair right now for how much? Dean asked, with lips still twisted. This is my niece. I'm not changing a charging trees for this. She already paid me to watch them. Ari had a defensive edge in her voice. Look, Dean said, standing up. In the hallways of their high school, Dean was this bubbly, gangly socialite. But right now, in the heat of this conversation, Dean's size made the room small for Ari, cornering her. I ain't trying to tell you what to do, but if you're not going to do anything with them wings, you should at least have business cards and a web page so you can get this African braid thing popping. You already know the clock is ticking with Rita. Now it was Aries' turn to twist her lips. Everybody up in this piece got a plan for me, and they ain't doing nary a damn thing themselves. You should be up at school doing park prep, but you here watching Real Wives of Beijing as if that got something to do with your future. Bean was undeterred. You my sister, so I'm gonna let that slide. Ari picked up a barrette and tossed it at Bean. You ain't gotta let nothing slide. 
you know you'll get handled. Being framed in that handle, Celia, move over here so I can beat down your aunt. The girl scurried out the way as he picked up a pillow and attempted to pummel Ari. Handle this, all the children screamed. Don't hit my aunt! and started throwing pillows at Bean and each other. Ari and Bean laughed until Ari put up her hands and said, Hold up, I don't want my wings to get messed up. That set Bean back on the offensive. If your wings get messed up, what's that going to mean, Ari? You're not doing anything with them. It's like if Jamario had got that infinity and then just kept it parked. Can you imagine Jamario not rolling through Liberty Heights and Mondawmin? I can't even see that, and that is just a truck. You got wings. Do you ever look at that book they gave you to see what you're supposed to be doing with them things? Ari sighed and frowned. Truth coming from a loved one shouldn't have to hurt, she thought. There was no denying what Bean was talking about, so she should at least try. In fact, part of her knew she was going to try, but it had to be her decision, not the outcome of some pet talk. I don't want to talk about it. I ain't thinking about flying. Use a lie. How could you not think about it? You can't sleep on your back no more. You can't sit in a regular car. And you trying to tell me you don't want to know what it feels like to be in control of yourself? I am in control of myself. No, you're not. You have part of yourself that you're not even using because you're scared. You don't know what I am. Harry stood up, her wings extending, knocking over the hair products and creating a rush of air. In spite of Aerie's small stature, her new appendages, easily stretching beyond the edges of the sofa, gave her a newfound presence that made Bean take a step backward. The size of the wings were compounded by their unpredictable movements. Aerie's reluctance to exercise her wings resulted in her having basic motor skill issues. I am going to do what I need to do to live my life, and these wings ain't got nothing to do with me living good or bad. Airy fumed as the wings intermittently flapped. The children ran for cover, laughing and imitating the motion of the wings with their arms. Bean ceased demurring. I just want to see you fly, Airy. I think that's the best living you or any of us could do. The friends silently picked up the barrettes in Greece, and Airy motioned for Celia to come back so she could finish her hair. The wings, after a moment, folded back behind Airy's back. The drone of the show on the video screen could not eclipse the buzz of thoughts circulating in the room. Latrice's daughters thumbing aimless, aimlessly through the National Geographic, pointing and asking questions about the vibrant fabrics worn by the Bamboo women and their intricate hair. Bean immersing herself in her calm, looking for anything to distract her from the fact that she felt her best friend was on the verge of throwing her life away. And finally, Ariel working feverishly on Celia's braids, jaw clenched, angry that her friend could cut so close to the heart of the matter with so few words. For Aerie, it was simple enough to ignore the voices inside of herself, but when someone pointed out that she was ignoring said voices, she was then faced with the choice of joining her first lie with yet another. That was the one thing she appreciated about both Bean and her Aunt Rita. There was no subterfuge in regards to where they stood on anything. Rita often said, hear what a person say, that's the trick. See what a person do, now there's the treat. I ain't about no tricks. Aerie had a dour thought at that moment. Everything she said about the wings to Bean and anyone else for that matter was the trick. Everything that she knew she had to do was the latter half of the equation a mountain for which she felt totally unprepared and wholly afraid to climb. But Ari knew she and Rita had at least one thing in common, and she pondered her path towards this most implausible of treats. <laughs>